from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to the Lucas and Roddenberry franchises, the Martian Chronicles, and beyond. Science fiction is undeniably a part of our culture. But what exactly is science fiction? And how do you write a science fiction novel? This series will attempt to answer those questions. And here we are live. Uh, viewers are, they wouldn't have got the countdown from Kate from 10. It was like a liftoff or some sort you know of what? like a shuttle mission or something like that. Yeah. It was great. I do, I do like the, You're a really uh, the cool mom, I think, cool. right? You're a cool mom. Well, you are probably a cool mom. I just, how do I, you know? I'd like to think so. <laughs> Although I'll tell you, <laughs> before, I kids, before I had kids, I, I was a way cooler mom. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. You know, in your head when you're like, this is how I'd parent. <laughs> Until yeah. you're in it. And you're like, no, no, it's a shit show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're all just surviving here, yeah. And, and uh, Adam, how's your uh, how's your how's your parenting skills before and after? Oh man, I don't know. My wife taught me everything I know about parenting, so she's uh, she's the champion around here. Yeah, but check this out, Dan. I got this book that you. Got us. <laughs> Have it. Okay. All right. So it's a peace offering to say well, it's only, still only got half the home. <laughs> I am three quarters of the way down. Wow. Look Ooh. at the, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we've got one student that's excelling and one that needs to go into the uh, <laughs> corner. Adam, can you uh, go clean up the parking lot while the real people talk right. about the. Uh... <laughs> Time out. Time out. I'm out, everybody. Yeah, sorry, excelling. excelling would be meeting objectives and going above. I didn't even meet the objective of reading the yeah. book. So, I mean, you let's really set the bar here. We both failed. I failed less. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. So, well, okay. Tell us. The overarching theme here, Caitlin. So we, we can get into it. A All bit. right, big data. So this, it was kind of interesting. I mean, it's if, if I downloaded the right book because I audiobook everything. Um, it's like a, a professor who's teaching a course, and he's kind of teaching it in a way that he's telling a lot of stories, which is nice. Um, Talking about data analytics and the power of it and the flaws within it and how you have to work around those flaws and why you need to have data analysts, how it can drive your business and how a bunch of people can spend a ton of money and not get anywhere with it and why that kind of is. What, what are the cruxes around data analytics um, that you know we have to keep the analysts around for? Like, why? You know, and there's some sanity checks in there. And I think... Adam, I don't know if you remember, we were on a project one time and uh, we were getting some really weird results. It's a pipeline routing uh, thing. And it was because the the LIDAR information was like offset and it wasn't. So the inputs were bad. So they talk about like garbage in, garbage out, having that sort of set of eyes to be able to do um, the the sanity checks essentially this is what i'm gaining from it from the most part and then some interesting things around like how much data we actually collect okay like and this is the uh, i mean they said this stat a couple times you're gonna like this you ready one gigabyte like 20 30 years ago was worth like a million dollars so uh, a 16 gigabyte phone would have been worth 16 million dollars at that time and if we have a 16 gigabyte phone today, we're like, ew, it doesn't wow. even do anything, right? There's just, we're collecting so much data. And um, what are we doing with it? How are we using it for good or for evil? We interviewed somebody about this, Adam. We did. That's right. Katera. Um, yeah, whether you like it or not, right? Some people are vehemently 
against, say, social media because Facebook's data on, uh, about you, right, or whatever. Um, so the point of view, this company says, like, hey, all this data is kind of out there. Why not, for, why not use it so that we can predict whether you're a good fit for a future employer or a psychologist or, you know, dating, whatever. Like, it, it can actually do, like, a personality and cultural fit for or you can use it for good as opposed to like marketers selling you stuff right, or whatever. But I'm really intrigued because if we're talking about this, this future and how companies can be run, you're talking about massive, massive amounts of data and history and algorithms and artificial intelligence, this kind of stuff. And maybe that's a cool place to play where, um, you know, this decision-making paralysis, maybe with all this data, Versus, you know, intuition and the human experience. You know, maybe there's a, a fun little niche we can touch on. I don't know how deep into it, how down the rabbit hole we want to go, but I think we can uh, allude to it. In fact, I think we need to go deep, real deep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Kate, are you getting, dirt, are you getting, are you getting dirty again, Kate? Oh, man. Well, you wonder when Kate, uh, <laughs> react, you know, is it something dirty? No. All right, no. you know, yeah. we're going deep. <laughs> we're going deep. We're going real deep. You know, this thing, we got to, we got to do that. Your guys' book, you know, this is your chance to do that, right? Like, you can't get, you can't create a fictional world inside of a, uh, you know, a client's office. You could, but they're not going to pay you for it. They'll buy your book, so let's do it there, right? Let's do it. We have to do it there. That's mm -hmm. your, that's your canvas to do, and 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 really let your creativity go, right? Yeah. Um, so I want to, I want to, I want to point a few things. Um, uh, you know. I want to percolate a couple ideas uh, in in this in this um, man. Now I got to stay away from certain words. I was going to say threesome or this kind of stuff, and I'm like, ah, Kate's in the room. I can't do that. Okay. Um, <laughs> I and this can't help it. it's hilarious. <laughs> I know it just. But okay, so here's the thing. There's, I want to describe the way society is in regards to data right now. Okay. There's a, there's a, a herd mentality, a general consensus that the establishment has a lot of information on us and it's a little bit concerning kind of thing, right? Like big brothers watching. I'm really concerned about that. I don't want to have it turned on me or, you know, this kind of stuff sensitive yeah. personal information this is a reality of how we're moving into this technology future right this um and in many respects the data world is very difficult to get ahead of because of the reasons that kate has just already explained we have like 16 million dollar like operating systems and computers in our pockets right like i have uh a several thousand dollar um, library that I walk around with and can access at any, you know, given moment, right? Like lots of books and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So that's a cherished piece of, of, of my life that I have right now. I mean, there's, there's, there's photos, there's libraries, there's an ability to not have to buy a fold out map because we can just consult with the Google Oracle, right? Technology is changing with us. Or we're changing with it, both, you know, in both sort of regards. Yeah. So I've always taken a, an optimistic approach to technology to diffuse some of the preconceived fears that are out there with, um, with technology. So the book that I was, um, that's in the middle of being edited right now is a book called Will Freeman, and it has to do with artificial intelligence. But the dominating um, narrative in our society is one of like a Terminator-ish kind of like the machines are going to take us over kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. And um, if you follow something like a transhumanist kind of conversation and say, well, there's an there's like 
an assimilation of, of the human entity into something more technology, um, like more of a technology substrate, uh, you know, we become more digital kind of thing. I'm not saying we have to give up our humanity, but why not try and have some sort of like, well, at least that was the point in my books to say that the, the artificial intelligence is not the, um, you know, the loss of humanity, right? That's not the loss. It was actually the savior of humanity because the premise is, is that, 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 um, there's an extinction event, right? We're, we're heading towards a complete annihilation of our, of our species. And now the scientific community is tasked with, holy shit, we have an expiration date. What do we put into technology to try and capture humanity? Quick, like we have like years left, that's it. How are we gonna do this, right? And it becomes our legacy, right? So where I'm going with this, with the data situation is uh, that, okay, go ahead. Yeah, Adam, go ahead. Well, I, you know, this, this kind of brings me in my mind back to when you had this do the time capsule exercise and I kind of, because in the past, if you wanted to communicate with the future, you put some stuff in a box, you dug a hole, you buried it and somebody did dug it up and they found your stuff and that's how you communicate it. Um, now, how, you know, do a tweet or write an email, there's a record of it created somewhere. Somebody in the future at some point looked that up and grab it or whatever. So like everything we do, my grandkids will be able to go into Facebook and just see me being an idiot as a teenager if they want, right? Um, the records are all there. It's It's, we're constantly communicating with the future, whether we like it or not, right? I'm not going to lie. I went into your Facebook back into your history to see what you look like with hair. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah? And what'd you think? Yeah. <laughs> I, I was, um, was never, you uh, look completely different. It was never extraordinary hair, but it was there, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> your son has extraordinary hair, though. Yes. Well, we're hoping he got Misty. Uh, has like beautiful locks. He has it cut short, but uh, we're hoping he gets her side of the family. That's for sure. <laughs> no, you, you, I wouldn't have recognized the two of you if you're walking beside like yourself 20 years ago. I, I would look like two different people to me. It was, it was a stark change, but I think you rock it both. Anyway, we digress to hair, which, you know, I, as we do but the big data <laughs> the big data situation and like you know talking about the time capsule and everything is really 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 interesting because um i think one of the things that in my mind is like 20 years ago we didn't collect nearly as much data we're collecting like trillions amount of data now and then like where are we 600 years from now, how much data will we be able to collect and how much of it will be able to use and process, right? And so we're collecting a ton of it and not doing anything with it. And a lot of companies do this. They collect it and they don't do anything with it or they don't know what to do with it or they can't clean it, right? They can't clean it to get valuable information out of. So when we automate that and then use like, for example, Dan, you're talking about AI, right? To then learn from it and be better at cleaning it and be better at giving us advice based on the data. That's huge being. And I think we talked about this, Adam, a little bit with our character is him being able to have a filter, right? Where analytics are coming to him in a meaningful way to help him make business decisions like in real time. So like he gets a notification that, um, mm -hmm there's a, a litigation coming up. He gets data analytics on that whole thing. What should he decide to do? What are the probabilities? Okay, what does he need to do? It's all there in front of him presented. You know, and it's like maybe a, a, a filter on the email that comes in. It says, do you, want to, do you want to see the analytics on this situation? Yes. You click it and you see everything all around it and you can make a good business decision. We're doing this at such a slow pace right now in companies, like in organizations, right? Like you have a whole team who handles risk management, 
right? And they bring it forward. And like, but imagine if you could make a business decision like that, how fast would business go? Like this guy could do so much. And we talk about it and, you know, how much more we're doing, even though we've automated so much of it, like we just keep piling it on and piling it on. We expect more and expect more. It's analytics and, and AI technology infused in what we're doing is, is going to make us a whole new level of capability. But do we lose that humanity? Do we, well, do we, sometimes you just get a gut feel. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, is that it's going to be, it's going to be difficult. And I'm trying to prime you guys for 600 years in the future. And how would you 600 years ago predict what we have today? Well, here's the great thing, Dan. We don't have to be right. Well, no, you don't have to be right. But you have to be plausible. Someone has to put that string together and go, wow, I could see how, right? So yeah. the, the thing that I wanted to prime you with that I think um, would be interesting to think about, okay, is that data should be individual. I think we're moving into information silos, okay, because we have a bandwidth issue. So, okay, say for example, in 600 years, I mean, this is immediate. It's even something that I picked up from that book is that you can have an algorithm that tells you in, uh, th that basically scours the rest of our society and says that you're better to fall in love with your third to fourth serious relationship in your life, right? Your chances of having okay. a successful marriage quadruple. Let's just say that's what the, right? That's what it is. Now, one of the problems about looking at data is that that's reflecting the way things are. And then there's a phenomenon that once you let people know and you reflect that mirror back to them, well, what does that say? How does that now change the data based on the awareness? You no longer, because you actually have the subjects interacting with that data saying, oh, that's interesting. Right. Back to short words theory. So, so the 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 idea is is that we need some way to bridge the future with the past. I'm listening to the news today, and I'm talking. You know, we we look at um, social sciences. We look at data driven decisions. Well, this is all empirical information of stuff that is collected out there. Does not ref it, it reflects a trend, but it's not a hundred percent predictive of what's going on in the future. Behind us lies a bell curve. Now there's a little double meaning on that lies the bell curve because it's, it's, it, it's, there's nothing saying that the bell curve is the prediction on the future. It can change, it can shift, the distributions can shift, right? And so there mm -hmm. seems to be an over-reliance on, on, uh, on the bell curve in academia right now. Uh, not so much emphasis on the um, the fragility of the systems and complex networks. So these are the types of things that I think as we move into a future society, we're going to have, um, we're going to have a society and individuals that understand what this data is and how to use it and better their individual lives. So, you know, what those examples are, that's what I'm hoping to kind of, you know, throw around with you guys because they can be like, um, you know, plot devices, right? They can be, you know, kind of jumping off points in the, in the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you kind of made me think of, you know, self-filling prophecy, right? And continue with your example, right? If I have data that tells me that, you know, if the third um, important or long, long lasting relationship in my life tends to be the one that sticks second you know <laughs> might find ways to sabotage it like subconsciously or some on the third one so you know if you imagine a world where you have all this data and ai and some of probabilities and maybe blah, 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 blah. like everyone can find the same data but like where where's the the crazy person you know the uh says that be everyone's house. I don't care what the world thinks right now. All right, or the Steve. 
job says, I hate focus group. You don't know what they want. I'm going to tell them what they want and I'm going to be right. You know, so where does that leave space for that crazy imagination, that innovation, that, that, and, you know, simply human piece that, um, you know, sometimes it just, we do it. We don't care what anybody says. Have you guys ever watched that show Shits Creek? <laughs> a couple yeah. of them. A couple of them. Okay, well, there's this guy that I, he's kind of kind of my favorite. I don't know. Is this this? He's this pansexual guy. I never heard that word before. I've heard that show, pansexual. So he likes everybody, I guess, right? You know. Um, and so we we had conversation about like gender neutral or like non gender specific kind of characters and this kind of thing. So, so let me throw an idea here. Is that let's throw a a, a love relationship in there, right? Like romance however you want to build that sort of thing um in between two people okay now building on what adam was saying you know what is like some of the themes of like that star cross lover sort of scenario it's like we're faded almost by the the google oracle and all the you know the powers that be that say that we're destined for oblivion we we can't actually have a long lasting relationship so you know, we're kind of fighting that, you know, we're fighting that. Well, there, there's a remnants of humanity there, right? To go against the odds, you know, that's there, you're the underdog, you know, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna make our love successful, you know? You know, when you're like, that's like that teen romance or something like that, you know, we're forever, this is my, this is, this is a guy I'm gonna spend the rest of my life with, or this is the woman that I know she's the one, right? Be like. Son, you're 15 years old, man. <laughs> right, like, but there's I know, but it's different. You don't understand, Dad. It's like there's such a connection there. Like, mm -hmm. she knows me better than I know myself. Of course, we're going to be together forever. Like, what's wrong with that statement? So, anyways, I'm so, trying. To, what I'm trying so. to do is you can you can really explore what those, um, you know, that kind of a relationship would be. Um, and, and maybe that's part of the narrative is to talk about, you know, all this information that we have of like analytics and like successful societies and relationships and all this kind of thing. And, you know, there's this movement against the analytics or maybe like uh, a return to, you know, the old days. So one of the mm -hmm. things I thought was really interesting while you were talking Dan is I had this picture. So our character on his journey, um, his pod, when he's going after his medical issue, right, he goes, uh, he's supposed to go to a, like, essentially a rehab center to reset his health, right? And he, his pod gets hijacked by space pirates, essentially. And he gets thrown into this other, like, I guess, um, developed, like, partially developed planet, right? Where there's humanoids of some type. Anyway, he leaves his pod and he goes and he's, but they're not plugged in. They're not chipped in. Okay. So he's essentially, he's been unplugged because that's part of his process. He's been ripped out of the system. They don't know. Right. And we talked about that whole data blockchain security. They, everything, they, if they assume it's so secure, they haven't seen that the pod's missing. It's been like, falsely plugged back in into the into the data. So he's out there and he's connecting with people. And one of the things that, you know, our character, and I say he, but we haven't landed on that gender thing. One of the things that our character uh, is experiencing is like eye contact. And he finds it like unsettling, right? And you just, uh, you just put this picture in my head. It's like with the introduction of, of technology, like even half the time when me and my husband are having a conversation, we'll bring up a question we don't know and we go to our phones to look it up. Well, like, how much time do I now, instead of looking at my husband in his eyes, am I in the phone having a conversation with him? Right? And like, just that one human connection piece, which is so critical. And if you've ever done that exercise where you actually like sit quietly and look at your spouse in their eyes for like 30 seconds, it's like, a very unsettling feeling, right? Because <laughs> it's just this 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 space to feel vulnerable and to be connected. And it's 
we don't often allow ourselves to do that. And so now when we're chipped in and we're constantly, you know, in this other realm working, interacting and connecting, do we lose that real connection of hu- like the human connection through just even looking into somebody's eyes? Mm. Anyway, that kind of set well, that in my mind a I'm scene just... that I would like. Mm-hmm. Well, there's so much to be said about body language, right? When we talk about intuition, we talk about the subconscious, you know, processing just insane amounts of data, you know, micro changes in the face, uh, temperature, smells, whatever. So, um, you know, maybe there is something to be said. You start having these more face interactions. You are still bringing in that data, but you're putting that supercomputer to work kind of behind the scenes, right? Why you're able to make those kind of split decisions. There's a great book called Blink by Malcolm Gladwell on that. But um, yeah, I kind of like where you're kind of pushing us to, Dan, right? We got to sort of play in this world a little bit about how do we make decisions? And then for first, how will we make decisions, right? Yeah, there's, um, <clears throat> I mean, and, you know, we can, we can spend some time on like, a Heidegger's a good, a good framework for that, because he talks about some things like an abyssal ground and a grounding ground and um, how we make decisions based off what's coming at the past, but that's also coming at us from the future. And he defines yeah. a, a being as Dasein. And in, in various different ways in early and later work. So there's like a, there's a whole structure of, you know, a framework that you could base some stuff on, right? In a strong philosophical tradition, which it means like, it's, it's, it's a really cool commentary. I think that's a great basis to make a statement because you have kind of an immediate audience, right? <laughs> like, you know, like you're being... You just gave me a really interesting idea. And oh, sorry. I was just going to note down the name, but I can watch it after. Sorry. Go ahead. So, you gave me a really interesting idea. So, if our character has these um, data analytics coming at him based off of history, right? Historic information being pulled forward and analytics are happening and he's then also presented with trending probabilities perhaps Mm -hmm. and also perhaps what this has done years over years over years has kind of conditioned us 600 years in the future to stop being innovative right because you're presented with all the probabilities but you're not presented with the innovation right Mm -hmm. And so, like, we still, like, plug along our growth trajectory, but you know how, like, we have huge jumps because of innovation and people thinking outside of the box and not accepting status quo and saying, screw the possibilities, I'm going to run that mile in under a minute or whatever, right? Like, Mm -hmm. people saying, don't tell me what to do is what actually gives us these jumps and sets us on a different trajectory, right? And so I think that if we were presented all of the analytics, all the risks and all the possibilities with the probabilities, we would be so apt to default to what's presented to us versus having a blank slate and going, okay, I got to do something. What am I going to do? So there's a certain amount of innovation that comes out of not knowing, right? And, and kind of mm. figuring it out. And, and so perhaps this will be one of the things that connects him back into his business. He, he connects back to humanity and then he also connects back into innovation, right? Something that's kind of been people have, you know, micro, we can call it micro innovation. They've micro innovated between the dots of probabilities and outcomes, but not those giant leaps. And maybe yeah. he's able to have one of those giant leaps because he's, He's thrown the analytics out and he said, like, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to get back to the real humanity piece of it. And I'm going to look at, I don't, I'm not going to have this kind of fog in front of me. 
Yeah. What if there was uh, to, to make that cultural though, Adam, just a sec, if you could make that cultural, you could develop a story where the, the grandfather was like a pioneer of that kind of thing. And then the, 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 the granddaughter, for example, would have been, would be somebody that is a part of this new movement. And there's many of these people that are, we call them the, the, um, the purists or something like this, right? It's like, they just wake up in the morning, they're not plugged in. They're like, you're what? You're not, how do you function? It's like, I don't know. I eat and I sleep and I breathe. We, you know. <sighs> We, have set. Yeah. We, do, we do all the stuff that people used to do as humans. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. That's, that's the, the epiphany moment for him is he has this interaction, this like kind of disbelief, this, and then after being stuck there and having to live with these people, it's this epiphany, right? For him. But then he gets rescued. He comes back and he's got to plug back in and it's like totally disorienting for him. Right. And then he's got to find the, the blend. He's got to still operate in this world. Like he can't just completely unplug and, and leave. Like he's got a family to raise. Like he still has to come back and live. So how does he find that blend? And that's, that's the journey he takes his organization on. And, and, and some against their will and some just like have been waiting, unknowingly waiting to have this come into their lives. It's like finding their EK guy. Mm -hmm. Well, it makes, you know, I have to imagine that, uh, you know, social science and psychology and all that, that would, would continue to advise is the technology, right? So when you're imagining this, how it gives you, you probably also have information about your personality profile or maybe an innovation profile or your tolerance or things like that but if i take a you know a piece from the movie gattaca right where it's genetics is the theme there but they're you know they're given the genetic genetics that they should do that or the other thing and the whole movie is about defying that right um that that exactly like we can in, in that area right because you could then be forced to make a decision oh no i don't file in front I mean, I don't know if this is a stressful moment and you just decide and maybe it works out, maybe it doesn't, but that's the point is that the, the human brain can decide and can do that without um, having all this um, data telling you that you know, your, your risk profile is this, you've been risky, you know, the past 10 decisions of the past 10 days have been this level of risk and now you're due for a less lower level or a higher one or whatever, right? Um, yeah, you uh, dig the cultural idea as well. I think we can play with that as well. Um, you know, interviewing cool. purists or the yeah. mm -hmm. good idea. Well, what do you guys think about this? I think we have this this actual like re we could test this in real life. Interview people in re in real life today with this phenomenon. So my wife went to mm -hmm. live, spent eight years in Costa Rica. Now, the cultural shock to get back into our fast-paced world is almost debilitating, right? Yeah. It's really an issue. Like, it's a really hard, um, you know, if, if you're younger and you're more apt to learning uh, novelty, you know, more receptive to new relationships, but something changes as you, you're not the same person you were at 18 than you were at 28. So, you know... That would be interesting as to um, as to have some like I don't know it's like we have endless amount of time that we can just keep you know let's bring people on the show and talk about like culture shock and moving from one you know culture to another culture I, you know a technology centric culture that seems to be what like North America is like right to something that's more relaxed laid back you know kind of thing. Have interviews? Uh, I don't know. So now you gave me an idea, Dan. So I think character then, you know, is unplugged, lands on a planet where they're kind of on system and he's kind of like welcomed and embraced, kind of taught by these, you know, uncultured gurus or sort of, right? But we could use that as a perfect example of a business or a company 
that is really good at introducing somebody to their culture and like welcoming them into it, right? We could have like really cool examples of how they how they do that, how they do it very specifically. You meet this person and then meet that person, and then this happens, and then there's a gathering, and then this happens, and here's your token, and right? We we can very specifically talk about how to culture integrate somebody. And then uh, that, that could be a really neat example contrasted to, you know, we could have a little story bit at the beginning about somebody new coming into this person's company and, you know, just kind of throw the wolves or you're just a number or you're just dead or whatever. Like we can contrast those two things very sharply, I think, if we, if we kind of yeah, they go it through the nicely. Um, I, lo I love that, Adam. They go through like the auto onboarding checklist and it's like, do you have your computer? Yep. Are you plugged in? Yep. Do you have this? Yeah. yeah. And it's like okay. never even talking yeah. to a real person, but they're fully onboarded. They've taken all their training. They've signed all the policies. They've done it all. All of the boxes have been checked and they haven't even talked to somebody who works there. Right? Like what a journey. And I think we can and make a... Uh, sorry, I was saying we make a really ironic statement there because some of the boxes could be called. I've taken my personality test. I did it to my team. I, you know, right? <laughs> you know, my right. I love it. Like that um that app. What's that new app? Well, it's not new. I think it's been around for a while and I and I know it's getting bigger. It's called Crystal, I think. Anyway, it's a plug into your computer and it actually does personality scannings on social media platforms. So like let's say you're on LinkedIn. Um and I want to talk to Dan, it'll scan his profile, give him a personality. Uh, attributes and tell me how to best sell him, how to partner with him and how to best like talk to him, how to cold call him. And so like, mm -hmm. we're, we're not far from this, man. We're not like, we're already dabbling in this world. Um, so it's, it's, I love that. They actually do a cultural piece and it's all automated. They don't ever talk to anybody. Here's your team. And like, we're all about team. And it's just like all these words that that way. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing yeah dystopia awesome. dystopia yeah. It, we went from it just, we went into the dystopia angle there i think right yeah the, the challenge is to yeah, say i, I think, think the innovative part is to say how do you make it non-dystopian but stay compatible with technology it seems like the easy it feels to me and i'm mm -hmm. i'm going contrarian on this right because i'm pro technology the idea is is that why does technology always have to end up in we have too much of it we're being disconnected right like how do you augment relationships how do you increase uh human interaction through technology right i mean i'm, I'm just a different a different vector right it doesn't always have to be you know the boogeyman right but I think that's the point is it's not, it's not utopia or dystopia. Like it's not yeah. one or the other. It's, it's just an uncomfortable place that has some really great benefits to it. And, but there are some things that are still missing. And I think even on the, we'll call it the Pura Vita planet, if you want the, the planet where he gets unplugged, there's issues there that could be solved with technology that they don't have the technology for. Right. And so it's not a matter of like all bad or all good. It's a matter of getting better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think growing. that's a reason. And I think, yeah. Yeah. Like technology, kind of a little satirical. And the journey is okay. Technology is great. I 100% agree, agree, Dan. But like, here's a way to use, interact better. Right. Um, you know, there's so many examples in, in business where we use things or even apps. But we use them wrong. We use them in the wrong context or we use them when they should be part of a larger system. We use only a piece of it or whatever. And, um, I think this is the kind of state. I can give you a perfect that, story about that. You know, all the technology you want, you have to apply a little bit of deliberation and intelligence to the, the human experience around it for it to do what it's maybe designed to do or what you need it to do. Yeah, 100%. Um, Kate's story, she has 
We have, yeah, a, we have about right. 10 minutes left, eight minutes and counting. Skate, right. Kate's got a story. So let's, let's hear that. So I've seen clients implement uh, a lot of like construction clients or clients that have field uh, crews driving around. They install the software to uh, track mileage, to track fuel, to track location, to track speed on all their field fleet, right? And so I've seen companies do it. Like, I mean, it's the same technology. It's the same data. And I've seen companies destroy culture and build culture with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've seen them take speed and make it punitive. And I've seen them take um, GPS locations and really like big brother it. <laughs> Excuse me, if you will. And then I've seen other companies take the exact same data and commend and say, hey, look, we, we lowered fuel consumption by this much. Great job. We're doing a great environmental impact. We're doing what's right. Hey, I saw you guys lowered your average speed by this much. I want to really commend you guys. It was how they applied the data back, right? Same technology, same data. Two huge different results. So that's where I think like we talk about data technology and culture. And if you're not, we, we joke around, are you using your data for good? Is it for good or for evil? Right. And we, we, when we interviewed Katera, we joked about this because data is being collected on you that like good luck, not getting data collected. You go off the grid, like best of luck to you. Data is being collected on you, whether you like it or not. So do you want access to it? And do you want to use it for good? That's what we need to promote is being able to use it for good. And that's the same in our characters organization, right? They've, they haven't, no one set that policy. We will use data for good, right? So now he needs to kind of turn his thinking around. Very good. I was wondering if the, if the collection of that data um, if it becomes a, a group a group commentary, right? You're not singling out any particular one person. You're saying overall as a group, we've lowered blah, blah, blah. Overall as a group, we've, as opposed right. to, mm -hmm. I think uh, Sally needs to come in my office here and we need to have a talk about why she stops at Tim Hortons every day. Right? Right. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah I think and if you take that approach, you end up with this like kind of it's the three musketeers syndrome, right? All for one, and all for all, right? The benefit for me and of it for everybody also benefits me. And you kind of realize that and you kind of like get in line. Oh, let's all, all bring the thing down. Right. Versus making very like specific. You three got out the top this month, right? You know, slow down. Um, yeah. You're reinforcing a team dynamic at the same time as you're, trying to produce an outcome. You know? So now we're getting a little philosophical on that as well. <laughs> that's great. I mean, I think that's that's really good. So where do you guys want to take the bit? I don't know if we need to dig more into the big data for now. I think we can kind of come up for air. And then uh, what's the goal for next, next week then? Back into the video commentary or what do you guys think? I would like to get, uh, I mean, from Adam and I's perspective of writing the book, I want to get our basic structure of the whole book kind of jotted down so we can kind of see and then start really delving deep into areas like um, like this topic and where it's going to plug in and what scenes and why is it relevant, right? Like for yeah. me, we've got a general, I want to get that structure highlighted. Okay, where's his epiphany moment? What's happening? And so then as we start talking about these things, we can be like, ooh, 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 we need to plug in this scene here because it's going to have an effect over here. So okay. um, I think that's what our homework needs to be for this week is really get that. And I would love, like, we could even make it so we can show it if we want to or... Yeah, what do you think? I would love to do two things. One, exactly what you said, and two, like bring up the timeline that we created and walk through it live and say, okay, this is what we think will happen here. And Dan, you can help us pick it apart and come up with cooler ideas or whatever. And maybe we decide that 600 is too far. Maybe we cut it in half and make it 300. Like, I don't know. But I would love to uh, take that timeline and do that. And then the same thing with you know, a table of content. Maybe these are two things we can bring to the forefront here in the next couple of weeks or a month or whatever. Yeah. I really think that's a great progress step, right? <laughs> okay. 
So yeah, do I, I still have we're... to record my video? I'd say, I'd say we pause on that for a little bit. I mean, I think the effort was, and it will start to become a little bit repetitive, but I think the, you know, the effect was there. So we could pause the video commentaries for now, right? Yeah. Unless you really want to do them. I mean, as fun as it is to get my sultry voice out, um, I think that I really want to focus on this path of the book for. It's enormous, right? You guys, I mean, you guys are running a company and, you know, for whatever time you're going to slot in to start doing the framework of the book and write a scene, that creative energy really needs to, you know, be used to, you know, to develop a scene and, you know, plug yeah. the various different pieces of the of the book together. So I think that's that's the, you know, next week's homework too. And um, you know, we'll just I think focus on that week to week and, you know, see where we can yeah. progress this after the summer. Yeah, you know, I love that idea. And it was a really okay. good like yeah. unstick to do those voiceovers. Like it got us to the point where like, okay, let us write now, Dan. Let us write. Like just we let us get into it now versus before we were like kind of all over the place. Now we're really jazzed to get in there and start writing. And if we get stuck, we can go back to doing those voiceovers again, get some more ideas going and then jump back in. I love it. Right on. Okay. Adam, do you have anything yeah. else that you want to, <laughs> what you want to say? Any closing remarks to the audience? No, I guess I'm excited about this forward momentum <laughs> and I'm super intrigued watching your uh, process unfold dan it's like you're you're slowly like pushing us and challenging us uh, in a direction i'm excited for this goes well yeah it's a process but i consider you guys friends too and it's uh, it's a pleasure to work with you so until next week uh thanks everybody for tuning in and stay happy healthy and connected and disconnected <laughs> Sounds good. Bye, guys. Happy Canada Bye. Day.